Okay, so today we're talking about chapter 47. We're going to get into liver disorders in this slide. Caring for clients with gallbladder, liver, and pancreatic disorders. Here is just a picture. We've got our diaphragm here. We've got our liver up here. We've got our common hepatic duct, which is going to drain everything from the liver. It'll drain it from the gallbladder as well. You can see where it connects up. Then we have our pancreas right here, uh, responsible for creating insulin, our spleen over here, and it comes down into our common bile duct and goes on into our small intestine. Okay, so the liver does a lot of different functions. One, it regulates glucose, and then it also stores that excess glucose as glucogen, which whenever we need it, when our blood sugar drops, it changes the glucogen back into glucose and we're able to utilize that. It will also synthesize amino acids from the breakdown of proteins, plasma proteins, um, synthesizes albumin, clotting factors, globulin. So it's a part of a big, big part of it, the clotting factor. Albumin is one of the most abundant plasma proteins, and we know that whenever we're looking at albumin on the lab, we're also checking out their nutrition. It helps maintain blood volume by pulling the tissue back into the capillaries. The liver is responsible for detoxification, synthesizing harmful toxins into less harmful ones. Uh, this is where alcohol, drugs, chemicals all get converted down. It will convert ammonia into urea, and so we know that ammonia, when it is not broken down into urea and excreted out, it can cause some um, serious confusion, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. The liver also stores vitamins. It synthesizes clotting factors, prothrombin and fibrogen. If we have a um, prolonged PT, we know that we are at risk for bleeding out or low platelets. It also forms and excretes bile and biliary veins. So you saw that large common uh, bile duct. That's where it all goes out and gets excreted. Okay, so with the liver, it can become jaundice or icterus, which is a yellow-greenish discoloration of that liver tissue, signs of underlying disease. So it's not actually a disorder, it's not a disease itself, but it is more a symptom of a disease, something else that is going on in the body. It results from an abnormally high concentration of bilirubin, our serum bilirubin um, to be jaundice, it typically has to be greater than 2.5. Normal A normal bilirubin level is going to be 0.3 to 1.9. And with jaundice, you're going to see this visible, visible yellowing of the skin, the oral mucosis, membranes, and sclera. And that's often in darker colored skin, people you will see in their eyes and in their mouths will have a yellow discoloration. There are three different forms of jaundice, and you can check those out on Table 47.1 page 773 in your book. Um, the first one is hemolytic and it's blood issues. Sometimes multiple transfusions, pernicious anemia, sickle cell anemia, just unhealthy red blood cells um, will cause this overproduction of bilirubin, immature blood cells. Hematocellular is going to be where the liver, liver cells are actually damaged and they can't clear the bilirubin from the blood. A lot of times this comes from viral infections, medications, or chemical toxicity. And then obstructive is where that bile duct is actually going to be obstructed and it can't pass through, it can't get through. Gallstones, inflammation, or tumors can cause this. And that bile is just not being able to be reabsorbed into the blood. Cirrhosis of the liver is degenerative liver liver disorder caused by generalized cellular damage. Basically, the liver isn't able to carry out all of its functions. We just talked about all the many functions it has to do. So this is gonna lead to disturbance in digestion and metabolism, coagulation defects. We're gonna be checking that PT. It's gonna be prolonged. They're at risk for bleeding. Fluid and electrolyte imbalances. And then it also has an impaired ability to metabolize hormones detoxify harmful substances, so it really puts our body at major risk. You'll see here we have a normal looking liver, it's very smooth, and then this one is more of that um, hobnail appearance, kind of bubbly and 
just doesn't look very healthy at all. There are several different types of cirrhosis. Laminex or alcoholics is going to be the most common, and we'll talk about that in a second. We'll come back to it. Post-necrotic is going to be destruct destruction of the liver cells secondary to infection um, or a metabolic disease. By, by biliary is going to be chronic obstruction or inflammation of those bile ducts and cardiac results from right-sided heart failure, lack of O2 and nutrients. And so with this, you can see, um, looking at that diagram again, there's the inferior vena cava, which also connects to that common bile duct. And whenever things get backed up, systems get backed up, that um, specifically right-sided heart failure, it can cause cirrhosis of the liver, lack of oxygen, lack of nutrients. So going back to Luminex, the alcoholic, it's caused by chronic alcohol use, poor nutrition, chronic poisoning with certain chemicals, indigestion of hep hepatic toxic drugs like Tylenol, acetaminophen, and typically this happens over a long period of time, at least 30 years or more. When someone has cirrhosis, it's not a pretty disease at all, and these are some of the signs and symptoms. One, they're going to feel really um, fatigued, lethargic, don't have much energy, anorexic, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. It's really going to me mess with their um, nutrition and just being able to absorb those nutrients. With uh, their stools, their stools are going to uh, change. They might be clay or whitish colored, and there's just absolutely no bowel in the intestine. You're going to see weight loss with it. You're going to see tea colored urine, which is because of the increased um, concentration of the urobilin. Abdominal discomfort, pain, shortness of breath. They're going to have really bad itchy skin, pruritus. Uh, the bile salts will accumulate on the skin. They'll have anemia, um, not being able to absorb or use their uh, red blood cells the way that they need to, not producing them correctly. Bleeding nose, gums after injections, they'll be lacking a lot of vitamin K. And a lot of times we're going to have to give um, either platelet or vitamin K injections to kind of help build those things back up. Because of this, you'll also see a lot of bruising. You're going to see a level of consciousness changes. They'll often be in a very confused state of mind. And this is all due to the ammonia levels, not being able to change over to uh, urea and get flushed out of the body. They'll have an enlarged liver, um, abdomen distension. A lot of times you will be able to actually palpate that liver, where on a healthy person right now, you cannot find the liver. You can't really feel it but for them it's going to be very large. You will see jaundice, you'll see caput um, medusa, and that's just where the abdomen veins are very dilated. And again, we have all this backflow and distension in those veins. When those veins distend, it kind of looks like uh, spider veins. And so that will be right on their abdomen. You'll have gynomastia, which is enlarged breast tissue, um, mainly on men. And then cutaneous slider angiomata, which is those tiny spider-like veins. Again, those veins are just all descending, backing up. For diagnosis, our typical diagnosis is going to be a liver biopsy, and it's going to be the most conclusive. However, we know that they are at high risk for bleeding, very, very high risk for bleeding. So sometimes, sometimes before we actually do a biopsy on them, we will give them an injection of vitamin K. We might even transfuse some platelets to make sure that they don't bleed out. We will be checking their labs, PTs. Um, again, if it's prolonged, then that's when we need to get the vitamin K or the platelets. Platelets, ALTs, ASTs, liver functions, LDH, ALP, serum pneumonia levels, a CMP, and a coagulation studies. All of these labs must be drawn beforehand. They are at risk for hemorrhaging, and that's really big, you need to know that, and abnormal liver enzymes. We can do a liver scan, we can do an MRI, we can do a CT scan as well to check on this uh, laparoscopy. There aren't really any specific cures for cirrhosis that exist at this time. We will give them lactulose, which is basically a laxative um, to decrease that serum ammonia. 
a lot of times it pulls the water back into the gut, which is going to cause diarrhea. So you will have, you will see a lot of diarrhea with um, lactulose being given. The aim is to prevent further deterioration and preserve any remaining liver function that they have at this time. So some complications that happen with cirrhosis. Portal hypertension is going to be the biggest one, um, which will also cause esophageal varices, ascites, and hematic cephalopathy. So with cirrhosis, what's happening? What are we doing exactly? Um, for nursing care, if the client has active alcoholism, we have to monitor their vital signs very closely. And what we're watching here is for detox. With their vital signs, Typically what's going to happen is that they are going to increase. They will have an increased blood pressure, pulse, the temperature, and all of these are going to be signals to us as nurses that they are going through alcohol withdrawals. With detox, um, what you're typically going to see is that there's just this nervous system stimulation. You'll have tremors, you'll have sweating, you'll have hypertension, tachycardia, palpations, cravings, seizures, hallucinations and their uh, central nervous system is just overstimulated. We will treat these symptoms appropriately. A lot of times we'll give them some Valium, um, and just depending on how much they've had to drink, they can go into this anywhere from like six hours and it can go up to 48 hours. And so we have to be very, very careful with this and know those signs and symptoms. You can find those um, in chapter 71, so you can look over those as well. Um, but detox can be deadly, so we have to be very carefully monitoring those things. We're also going to be watching their daily weights, strict eyes and O's, um, monitoring mental status real closely. Remember that ammonia let pool can make them go um, get confused. And then we're going to educate them. They have to stop using alcohol. They have to stop using Tylenol or whatever is causing the cirrhosis. They have to stop and we have to be careful. Um, not to create any further damage to our liver. With portal hypertension, this is something that does occur with cirrhosis. Basically, the portal system, including the veins of the stomach, the intestines, the spleen, the pancreas, the portal vein, showed you a picture of that. All of those things um, are included in this, the portal system. So basically, these veins drain into and through the liver, then they go out through the inferior vena cava. However, when you have a damaged liver, it's going to obstruct that blood flow, and it's going to cause that blood flow, flow to back up into the portal system. Because of that backflow, it causes congestion and increased pressure, which equals the portal hypertension. And so you have everything just kind of backing back up. The normal pathway is going to be obstructed, and that means that those veins, those branching veins, are going to engorge with blood. And so you're going to see it up in the esophagus, which is called esophageal varices. It's going to actually cause um, bleeding in the esophagus. You're going to see a patient splitting up, spitting up blood. You'll also see it in the rectum because of hemorrhoids. They'll dilate and it will cause hemorrhoids. So you'll also see bleeding um, from the rectum. And then the abdomen, we talked about this earlier, abdomen, caput medusa, is basically these spider-like veins that are on the stomach. And so you can um, see right here in this picture. Here is our inferior vena cava, and then this is our portal vein. So right here we have cirrhosis, and it gets obstructive. It's not able to go into the liver the way we it's supposed to. Here you see the um, nodules all over those livers. And then here we have, here's our stomach, here's our spleen, here's our portal vein. Everything just gets backed up. It gets backed up in here, causing esophageal varices. It gets backed up down here in the anus, causing hemorrhoids in the stomach, this caput medusa. Um, distended veins all over. So you can kind of see how that plays out. And these are the signs and symptoms that end up happening. Esophageal varices, caput medusum, hemorrhoids, marked ascites, lots of fluid on the stomach, hypersplenism, uh, anemia, sorry, the spleen isn't working right and therefore um, blood is not being created the way it needs to. We'll have anemia, neutropenia, 
thrombocytopenia, and all of these are signs and symptoms of liver failure. Okay. With portal hypertension, the treatment, the aim is to reduce fluid ac accumulation and venous pressure. So the way, one way that we're going to use, um, reduce our fluid accumulation will be through diuretics. A lot of times we'll use spirolactone, uh, spirolactin, aldactone, furosemide, Lasix. We also have to get that hypertension down, and so we're going to use beta blockers. Propanol, Indorel, they will reduce the blood pressure. And then we will have some lifestyle changes as well. They need to stop um, consuming so much sodium. Water, of course, loves sodium and it holds on to it and it keeps it in that body and that just makes our ascites so much worse. Esophageal varices, here you see the dilated vessels that occur at the lower end of the esophagus. They are prone to bleeding and it can be life-threatening. So um, a singular is varinex. Rough food trauma can also cause profuse bleeding. So if they start bleeding here, this can be a very life-threatening thing, a very life-threatening to athlete. Signs and symptoms, uh, spitting up blood is going to be the first one. Copy ground emesis, a lot of times it'll look kind of black. Melina, which is tardy stools, tachycardia, hypotension, anemia. Uh, to diagnose it, we'll do a barium swallow eval and esophageal scopy. Treatment, however, is going to be similar to the portal hypertension. We're going to reduce the fluids, um, decrease that venous pressure, give them diuretics, use beta blockers, get their blood pressure down, restrict sodium so that that fluid isn't staying there. We'll use a soft diet, something that isn't going to be harsh on the throat or cause bleeding. And then we'll use this thing called balloon tamponade. And you can see a great picture of this in your book on 783. Sing, sing statin Baltimore tube. And so basically what it's going to do is apply pressure in really severe cases where you're bleeding. It will balloon up and that tube will stay in place um, in the esophagus, in the stomach. And um, with this, one measure that you have to do as a nurse is always keep scissors by the bedside in case they start um, choking, not breathing. You can go in, you can cut that tube, and it will deflate the balloon, and you can pull it right out. Um, bad thing with this one is it usually doesn't always work that well, and so they'll end up having to come and get a scolarapy or a banding done. With the balloon tamponade, it's great in emergency situations. If we have a little bit of time, though, we'll do a scolera therapy, which is the banding, and it's an endoscope that locates that barracks, that bleeding spot, and places a rubber band around it to stop the bleeding and allow the barracks to slough off. Of course, then the band, you go ahead and swallow it just like normal. Okay, so here's um, a picture of our balloon tamponade or our Sing Statin Blackmore tube. With this, we want to maintain the airway. We want to keep the head of the bed at 30 to 40 degrees. And of course, we want to keep scissors at the bit at the bedside in case the airway does become obstructive. You cut that tube, you remove the entire thing, it will deflate the balloon. But you can kind of see where, um, right here, it just compresses that and helps stop the bleeding in there. Ascites is going to be a collection of fluid in the peritoneal cavity. Portal hypertension is an underlying cause. Increased pressure with portal hypertension forces serum proteins to move into the peritoneal cavity. Um, the proteins will draw the fluid, the plasma, from the bloodstream by osmosis. And all of this extra fluid just pools in that peritoneal cavity. A lot of times you will see men with this and it looks like they are pregnant. They just have a very, very large belly just full of this fluid. The kidneys respond by initiating the renin, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And remember, aldosterone, it loves to hang on to salt, so it, it's hugging salt. Al's hugging salt. Um, this makes the body retain more sodium, and then with the low blood volume, it may suppress the antidiuretic. Antidiuretic, antidiuresine 
releasing that fluid. So it's suppressing that and we have fluid now being retained instead of excreted in our urine. The body's natural response is actually going to be making it worse. So these things are actually working against it. Our renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, and our antidiuretic hormone are kind of fighting us on this. The treatment will be to use diuretics, spirolactone, allodactone, sodium restriction, and beta blockers. We will use potassium sparing. Diuretics are going to be preferred. So we hang on to that potassium. I know potassium plays a very important role in our heart. We can do a paracentesis, which is actually going into the stomach cavity and drawing up that fluid. So we can draw up to four liters out safely. If more needs to be drawn off, IV fluids will be given to prevent severe hypotension, kind of give them albumin, which albumin will put fluid back into that vascular section, which um, will allow just blood to be in the vascular. It will help with our um, blood pressure. And then we're going to monitor their eyes and nose and, of course, their blood pressure. Here is a great picture of ascites. It's not only ascites, but you can also see his skin is very jaundiced as well. Hepatic encephalopathy. Okay, so central nervous system manifestations of liver failure, it often leads to coma and to death. And so what's happening is that this ammonia is forming by bacterial action, ingesting proteins in the intestine, um, and just having a large buildup of ammonia. A healthy liver will detoxify that ammonia, it will convert it to urea, and it will flush it out through the urine. Um, however, damaged your liver cannot carry out this function, so the ammonia accumulates in the bloodstream and enters the brain cells by crossing the blood-brain barrier, and this causes the brain to swell and compress, leading to coma and to death. So signs and symptoms that you're going to see, first one, level of consciousness. Disorientation, confusion, memory loss, lethargic, coma. Um, and of course, we know that a coma is a last state. We want to be able to wake that patient up. That's not a good sign. Flapping tremor, which you can uh, YouTube that, Google that. You'll find the videos of that. It's usually going to be caused in the hands, and it's by toxins of those peripheral nerves. But that Babinski, you're going to see a positive Babinski, and basically when you take your pen or anything on their foot, their toes and everything are going to flare out. We know that this is a bad sign. Um, it should not be present after 12 to 18 months of age. You'll see it initially in a newborn flare out. After that, we should never see it on an adult. When that child starts walking, you never want to see a positive Babinski. It does represent neural involvement. You'll also be able to smell the sulfur breath odor. It's me metabolic and in products not exiting the body with waste. Um, signs and symptoms increase after a meal high in protein. Uh, protein creates a lot of ammonia, so it causes those liver that those levels of ammonia to rise if you eat a diet that is high in protein. And also a GI bleed creates uh, high levels of protein. Or sorry high levels of ammonia as well. So you'll see higher ammonia levels after eating a meal high in protein or with a GI bleed. Diagnostic, we're going to do a serum ammonia level. We'll be able to draw it from their blood. It will be very high related to the liver's inability to break it down into urea. EEG may show abnormal brain waves. Treatment is to eliminate any kind of dietary protein remove the blood from the GI tract, we just talked about that, protein and a GI bleed increases the ammonia. We're going to deplete the intestinal microorganisms with drugs, laxatives, and or um, enemas, and then we're going to give some antibiotics back into the gut to destroy that bacterial infection and lower the ammonia levels that way. Lactulose is going to absorb that ammonia and eliminate it through stool, so you will have your patient will have diarrhea, but at least they're getting rid of that ammonia. Uh, levodopa, dopamine, it's going to restore those transmissions back in the brain. We probably will need IV fluids, TPN, because our, their nutrition is already very messed up. Multivitamins to maintain those nutrition. And it is a very poor prognosis for this person without a transplant. And usually 
anyone who has board board damage as severe as this usually gets rejected for a transplant. We're going to stop right here.